Howdy, eggs. This podcast focuses on the evolution of climate and tectonics during the Cenozoic. Prior to listening to this material, you should make sure that you understand the material covered in the podcast entitled Ocean Circulation for Earth Historians. Let me start with an overview of long-term climate trends. This figure is commonly referred to as the Zakos Curve, after the guy who compiled all the data. It represents a summary of stable oxygen isotopes and stable carbon isotopes from benthic, that is to say bottom-dwelling, foraminifera for more than 40 deep ocean cores. Let's start with the carbon isotope curve. Remember that the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 is a proxy for changes in Earth's carbon cycle. Overall, the Cenozoic has been largely stable. Even the few excursions that are present are of much smaller magnitude than, say, the end Permian. So, for the most part, you can see it's pretty stable all the way up through here. There's a little bit of waviness down here, there's some minor stuff all the way through, and there's a drop towards the present day. In contrast, the oxygen-18 curve is quite variable. Remember that this is the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16, and it's a proxy for both temperature and glacial ice volume if there are ice sheets present on Earth. Since these data were measured from microfossils formed at the ocean bottom, the trends seen in the oxygen isotope curve primarily reflect polar conditions, because ocean bottom waters form at the poles. Now, what we see here is that the early Cenozoic down here was quite warm as much as 12 degrees warmer than the present day during what is now called the Early Eocene Climatic Optimum, this peak right here. Note the short, sharp excursion right at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary. That's this right here. That's the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum event. After the Eocene Climate Optimum, there's a long, gradual cooling trend down through here, until there's a sharp drop at the Eocene-Oligocene boundary. That's this. The Eocene-Oligocene coincides with the earliest evidence for the formation of ice sheets on Antarctica. Now, after this, the Miocene is another time period of relatively warm conditions, not as warm as the, uh, the early Eocene, and after the Miocene, things gradually cool down until the present day which is actually the coldest time of the entire Phanerozoic. Now, there's an additional plot shown on this slide. That's the one here on the far right. This is a compilation of proxies for carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So, although we're at 400 parts per million today, pre-industrial levels were actually at 280 parts per million, which is probably closer to the natural state of Earth if humans weren't actually active on its surface. Now, the estimates of carbon dioxide here are primarily given by geochemical proxies rather than plant, stom plant stomata densities as we've seen before. Nevertheless, all the different kinds of proxies indicate very similar stories. The Cenozoic started down here with carbon dioxide levels as much as 10 times or more pre-industrial levels. And these have decreased through time until the end of the Oligocene when they leveled off. Despite stable carbon dioxide levels for the last 25 million years, that's this interval up here, temperatures have continued to cool from the Miocene to the present, through here. So, our question to be addressed through the rest of this podcast is, what caused all these shifts and trends? Well, there hasn't been a biological revolution, like, say, the invention of photosynthesis or skeletonized multicellular animals, so let's take a look at tectonics for changes in the Earth system. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Paleogene, the first period of the Cenozoic, which ranged from 66 to about 23 million years ago. Overall, in terms of global tectonics, things look fairly familiar. All the modern continents have separated from one another by this time in Earth history, and they're identifiable as such. Through this time period, there are really three major events that I'm going to discuss. The first is that India, which starts off down here, eventually collides with Asia to raise the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya Mountains.
Another major tectonic change is that Antarctica becomes isolated from South America and Australia as they drift further away from it. And lastly, the remains of the Tethian Ocean close, resulting in a long chain of mountains from the Alps and Carpathians in Europe to the Caucasus in the Himalayas. So this little strip of oceanic stuff here is mostly what's left of the Tethys in the early Cenozoic, and by the time we're up here, a lot, a good part of that is closed. Much of that is associated with the collision of India, but we'll come back to that in a slide or two. Before we move on to the rest of the world, let's take a look at what was happening in North America. Early on in the Cenozoic, North America starts with continued convergence and subduction along its Pacific margin, and continued rise of the Laramide orogeny which started in the Cretaceous. That's part of what lifted chunks of the Rocky Mountains. However, in the Oligocene, a change occurs from compressional tectonics in western North America to extensional tectonics, and this is tied to the opening of the Rio Grande Rift. This extensional regime in western North America has continued to the present day and is expressed today as the growth of the Basin and Range province. As a side note, much of what is now East Texas was deposited through this portion of the Cenozoic. These are the sediments that are exposed at Lake Somerville and that you studied during the field trip. Okay, so back to North American tectonics. What caused the stress regime in Western North America to shift from compressional to extensional? What the maps show here are the evolution of oceanic crust in the Pacific Basin. 80 million years ago, there were three oceanic plates underlying the North Pacific. The pink here is called the Kula Plate, this blue color is what we now identify as the Pacific Plate, and the green is the Farallon Plate. At around 42 million years ago, the spreading center separating the Pacific Plate and the Farallon Plate entered the subduction zone along the western margin of North America. That's what's happening here. The result was a fundamental change in how these plates interacted and pushed against one another. Over the rest of the Cenozoic, the remains of the Farallon Plate were subducted under North America until only two small fragments are left today, what is now called the Juan de Fuca Plate up here along the Pacific Northwest, and another fragment called the Cocos Plate that underlies parts of Western Central America. The margin shifted from a convergent subduction boundary to a transform boundary that is now defined by the San Andreas Fault System, which moves the Pacific Plate along the margin of North America rather than strictly under it, as it would if it were a subduction zone. Okay, so that's what was happening in Western North America in terms of tectonics during the Paleogene. Now I'm going to shift to the Southern Hemisphere. Remember on the Zakos curve that there was a sudden cooling event associated with the Eocene-Oligocene boundary indicated in the stable isotope curve. So the question is, why was that shift so sudden and why did it happen at that particular time? The change is associated with the initial formation of ice sheets on Antarctica. So, what's going on? Let's start off with the present day. As you can see on the map on the lower left-hand corner of the slide, Antarctica today is surrounded by ocean water and it's essentially isolated from any other continents. The Southern Ocean is characterized by a current called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current that flows continuously eastward around Antarctica. As a result of this current, warm surface currents from the lower latitudes can't reach Antarctica, which keeps it really, really cold. However, without the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, Antarctica could have been substantially warmer because it would have, been, would have had heat delivered by these surface currents. Well, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current flows through two relatively narrow passages. The first is the Drake Passage between Antarctica and South America, indicated here. The second is the Tasmanian Gateway between Antarctica and Australia, which is here. 
In the Mesozoic and early Cenozoic, these passages were closed because Antarctica was still tectonically connected to the other fragments of the Gondwanan supercontinent, and therefore there was no Antarctic circumpolar current yet. However, the inexorable process of continental drift eventually resulted in the opening first of the Drake Passage around 41 million years ago. This timing is based on neodymium isotope ratios in Atlantic and Pacific sediments in deep ocean cores. Prior to around 41 million years ago, the values from these two oceans were very different, but afterwards they are similar, indicating that water from both oceans was free to mix and therefore the Drake Passage had opened. The opening of the Tasmanian Gateway is based on sediments recovered from IODP cores. This passage got deep enough for the Antarctic circumpolar current to flow in a series of steps between 35 million years ago and 30 million years ago. The figure on the upper right hand side of the slide shows a reconstruction around 35.5 million years ago and you can see how the currents in the Pacific are deflected along the eastern margin of, North, uh, of Australia. That's what this is right here. The lower figure is the situation around 30.2 million years ago. The main difference is the presence of the current indicated by the thick gray arrows, this current through here, that flows eastward along the southern margin of Australia. Once the Antarctic circumpolar current began to flow, it rapidly led to the climatic isolation of Antarctica and the formation of the first Antarctic ice sheets and very cold downwelling waters that formed a new source of oceanic bottom waters, essentially what is recorded by the oxygen isotope signal depicted in the Zakos curve. The sharpness of the isotopic shift indicates that this change occurred very quickly once the tectonic context made it possible. Okay, so the tectonic history of Antarctica during the Paleogene is an example of how plate tectonic shifts and continental drift can change oceanic circulation and thereby change essentially global climate, leading to a major cooling event. But remember, through much of this time, between about 50 and 20 million years ago, there was a long-term decrease in CO2 levels associated with a long-term cooling trend. What could have been happening to, change, to have this effect on temperature and CO2? Well, the main event during this time is tectonic. This was the time when the continent of India collided with Asia, resulting in the rise of the Himalayan mountains and the Tibetan plateau. Now remember, back in the Mesozoic, the supercontinent Gondwana began to break up into the continents of the Southern Hemisphere, Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, and India. India drifted northeastward from Africa toward Asia resulting in closure of the eastern Tethys Ocean. Tectonic reconstructions indicate that the collision began around 50 million years ago, and it has actually continued all the way to the present day. This is one of the most massive orogenic events of the Phanerozoic, resulting in the highest mountains in the world today, and the elevation and rise of the Tibetan Plateau. Now, the Tibetan Plateau stretches around 1,000 kilometers north-south, and around 2,500 kilometers east-west, and it has an average elevation of about 5,000 meters. Here's what this means. The Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau expose an enormous volume of fresh continental rock to weathering and erosion. In fact, although the Tibetan Plateau receives only about 5% of meteoric precipitation in the world, it contributes around 31.9% of all dissolved material to the oceans, and 17.6% of all suspended detrital material. In other words, these mountains that are so high are, are the major force in weathering and erosion on Earth today and while they were rising. Essentially, the collision of India with Asia resulted in a long-term decrease in CO2 for two reasons. First, as the continents collided, they shut down the volcanism associated with the subduction zone that had been present between them prior to the collision. In addition, the Himalayan orogeny uplifted so much new fresh rock for, to be weathered that it's drawn down CO2, 
This process appears to have started around 50 million years ago and has lasted till at least around 20 million years ago. This shift is actually recorded in the strontium isotope ratios, which remember are a proxy for the rate of weathering on Earth, shown in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. In other words, this is the time, this is the early uh, Cenozoic through here, and this rise in strontium 87 to strontium 86 ratio appears to reflect primarily the, the increase in weathering rates associated with the rise of the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. Okay, now we're at a point in Cenozoic history where we actually move into the next period of the Cenozoic, the Neogene. It lasts about 20 million years and ends only 2.59 million years ago. Nevertheless, the paleogeographic reconstructions shown here make an important point. The two globes shown here look very similar. The differences between the two are very subtle. However, these subtle differences in the distribution of continents and how they were connected to one another had substantial effects on climate, ocean circulation, and the distribution of life, as we'll see. I mentioned earlier that the Pacific margin of North America had undergone a significant tectonic reorganization from a convergent boundary with subduction to a transform boundary through the Paleogene. The result was the end of the Laramide orogeny, which had started in the Cretaceous, and the beginning of extension in Western North America. That initially started with the opening of the Rio Grande Rift up through central New Mexico and down into the Trans-Picos region of Texas. That extension continues to the present day and has resulted in the formation of the Basin and Range Geologic Province of the Western United States. It's focused on Nevada, Southern California, Utah, parts of Arizona, and New Mexico. This is a region of thinned continental crust that has undergone 100% lateral extension since around 17 million years ago. It's subtle on this series of maps up here from 15 million years ago to 3 million years ago. But if you look closely, you can see that Western North America is stretched westward through the Neogene. The Miocene also saw the uplift of the Colorado Plateau, which is centered on the Four Corners region of North America. That's this area right here. And it also saw the uplift of the ancient roots of the Appalachians, which had been eroded flat through much of the Mesozoic. In Texas, the uplift of the Colorado Plateau resulted in the deposition of eroded material to form the High Plains, including the youngest strata of the Texas Panhandle. I've already discussed the collision of India with Southern Asia. Essentially, this was part of the process of the subduction of the entire Tethian Ocean crust. The collision of India with Asia was at the far eastern extent of the Tethys, and it started as early as 50 million years ago, and is actually continuing to the present day with the continued rise of the Himalayas. The western end of the Tethys didn't have a large continent colliding with Asia, but it did include a large number of small island arcs and crustal fragments. The accretion of these crustal fragments left bits of former Tethys ocean crust with, stuck within Asia, specifically the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So, 20 million years ago, these materials here were continental fragments there was oceanic crust between them and Asia. As these converged northward, they closed off the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, which are today still underlain by oceanic crust. Now, as this convergence continues, Africa and Arabia begin to collide with Europe, which causes the Caucasus Mountains to, to rise. The Caucasus are these mountains here at the eastern end of Turkey between the Black Sea and the Caspian. Essentially, what this has done is pinch off the eastern end of the Mediterranean, which used to be continuous with the rest of the Tethys. Around six million years ago, Africa continued to migrate north and eventually converged and pinched off not just the eastern end, but also the western end of the Mediterranean, 
The result is the complete isolation of the Mediterranean Ocean Basin. Because of the relatively warm latitudes that the Mediterranean was at, it began to dry out, and this event is called the Mycenaean Salinity Crisis. It resulted in the deposition of hundreds of meters of evaporites throughout the Mediterranean Basin, shown on this map down here. Subsequent sea level rise has reconnected the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic, but only through the very narrow Strait of Gibraltar at the far end between Spain and Africa. Quite literally, just 5 million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea didn't exist. It was literally a large salt plain desert that you would have been able to walk across, if there was water, from Europe all the way to Africa on dry land. The last tectonic event that I'm going to discuss in the, in the Cenozoic is the closure of the Isthmus of Panama. Prior to about 3 million years ago, South America and North America were separated by a passage of marine water, shown here on this map. Sometime around 5 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama, what we now think of as Central America, began to rise out of this narrow passage. Eventually, it rose up high enough to physically connect the two continents. This had two results. First, it mixed the terrestrial faunas of North America and South America. South America had been isolated since its separation from the other Gondwanan continents tens of millions of years ago. It had a very unusual marsupial population and has a lot of really unusual mammals. Many of those migrated north, including typical residents of North America like possums and, here in Texas, armadillos. At the same time, mammals from North America migrated across the land bridge to South America. Um, this is the source of llamas, which are actually closely related to camels, which were common in North America just a few million years ago. More significantly for climate, however, the closure of this passage changed the way that surface currents flow along the western margin of the Atlantic. So, whereas currents had been actually pretty weak just a few million years ago, because they could pass and mix through this passage, all of a sudden, all of these warm water currents got redirected up northward. And this fundamentally changed the formation of, uh, of deep waters in the North Atlantic. We'll see exactly what that effect was when I talk about Pleistocene climate change over just the last few million years. In any case, the major lesson of this podcast is simply that various tectonic changes have greatly influenced oceanic circulation and climate over the last 65 million years. And understanding the relationship between the two, how one influences the other, and how they can both influence life is instrumental to understanding this period in Earth history. That's all I have to say for this topic. I'll see you in class.